Last week, we began a new series of messages entitled, How to Develop Strong and Overcoming Faith. And as I've said that some of you, many of you have heard teaching on the subject uh, and the concept of faith before, but some of you have not. For those of us that have heard it before, these things are a re refresher. Uh, for those of you that have not heard it before, it'll help you to lay hold of some things that there's more than what meets the eye, uh, as they say. There's so much more that God wants to do in and through us, and uh, it can only be done by faith. So with that... Uh, I would like to read the opening scripture again that we started with last week. And um, then we're going to pray and then we're going to trust God that uh, a fresh revelation comes into our hearts this morning. So Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. Um, it says, We are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to this life of faith. Let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. And let us run with endurance the race that God has set before us. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. And so, Heavenly Father, we thank you again for the preaching and the teaching of your word. The Lord, you are present by the power of your Holy Spirit to bring revelation into each and every one of our hearts. And we thank you, Father, that, Lord, as your word goes forth, that it changes our lives, it renews our mind, that our faith rises to new levels, and we are receiving, and we are laying a hold of fresh wisdom, fresh knowledge, and fresh understanding. In Jesus' name, amen. Last week we laid a foundation um, on the whole subject of faith, uh, I guess to be able to build on in uh, future messages. I would like to do a quick recap before we uh, begin to cover new ground. Uh, we said last week that living by faith and developing strong faith um, begins with a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Um, and we said that everybody who has received Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior has received a measure of faith. Nobody's been passed over. Nobody has been left out. But faith is only in the heart of God's people. Um, and um, so we said that uh, once we have received this measure of faith, it is our responsibility to develop and to grow that measure of faith. We talked about the fact that the Bible speaks about varying levels and degrees of faith, right from on the one end to no, from no faith all the way across to the other end of, of strong and overcoming faith. And uh, we also asked a question and we said, well, what is faith for? Well, we said that we are saved through faith. Um, so that's first and foremost necessary for us to, to, uh, to walk by faith. We said that uh, we are made right with God by faith. Uh, the word also says that we live by faith. We walk by faith, not by sight. We stand by faith and we can please God only by faith. And of course, I've reprinted those lines there in your outline just as a quick reminder. Um, then we asked a question and we said, what is faith? Well, we said that faith is believing the written word of God over and above what we can see with our natural eyes. People of faith can see things that are not visible with the naked eye, so to speak. And we said that as the people of faith, we are prepared to believe before we see. But people, people without faith demand to see before they're prepared to believe. And that sets us apart from the rest. We are faith people. When we read the Word, it speaks about things that we do not yet see with our physical eye, but we believe it. And because we believe it and we choose to walk by faith, we will see it. And then we asked the last question and said, how do we get faith? Because people really want to know. And as I say, this teaching has revolutionized Pastor Vanessa in my life when we were a young couple uh, and uh, sort of trying to make life work and trying to make things work and everything. When we found out that faith comes by hearing, um, According to Romans chapter 10, verse 17, we says, well, it stands to reason then if we hear more word, we're going to have more faith rather than less word and having less faith. So we decided that missing church wasn't going to be an option for us. We decided that we was going to double up. And at that time, uh, the church that we were in, they had a morning service as well as an evening service. And we said, we're going to get into the evening service as well because more word means more faith and our faith will be strengthened. And uh, as I said, uh, all of these things that we have 
have described, we have endeavored to practice over the years. This morning, I would like to speak to you about the four pillars of real Bible faith. And that's the subtitle of today's message, the four pillars of real Bible faith. And when we say Bible faith, we mean the faith that the Bible describes rather than, rather than some wishful thinking or some hoping that sometimes people do. We are describing real Bible faith in these sessions here. Um, and uh, I guess just to describe what that looks like, uh, really any building or any structure requires strong pillars or low bearing walls so it can stand, it can function, and it can remain upright and doesn't collapse. And really, faith is very similar to that, uh, that faith requires strong pillars in order for it to function, in order for it to be steady, and in order for it to, to, to do what it is supposed to do and not collapse. And uh, as we've said, there are four pillars that I would like to cover today. Uh, for many of you, it will be reminders, but it's interesting how it works, that unless we're reminded of these things again and again and again, it is easy to let things slip, because the reality is, friends, that we're surrounded by doubt and unbelief. Uh, we live in a world of general unbelief. We, we live in a world of doubt, so it's good to refresh our thinking uh, in this whole area of faith. So here in Hebrews chapter 11, I want to pick up on uh, one verse of scripture that we had uh, in our message last week, but I want to repeat that again, and then I want to highlight two, three words uh, out of that verse here to describe the first of those four pillars. Hebrews 11 verse 6, it says, it is impossible to please God without faith. Anyone who wants to come to him must believe. Everybody say, must believe. All right? Everyone who comes to him must believe that God exists and that he rewards those who sincerely seek him. And the three words I would like to highlight out of that verse here is faith must believe. And that is the first point or the first pillar that I would like to bring to your attention today is that faith must believe. Faith must believe. Um, sometimes people claim to have faith, but they don't believe. All right? And real Bible faith must believe. Now, I know it can't get any more basic than that, but I did say that we was going to do a teaching uh, on faith from the ground up um, so that everybody's able to join in, and even if people have not had this kind of teaching before, they're able to lay a hold of it uh, so faith must believe. A faith that doesn't believe is really no faith at all. All right. And uh, in Romans chapter 4, uh, the Bible speaks about faith extensively, actually. And it talks about Abraham. Um, and of course, Abraham, the Bible tells us, is the father of all them who believe. Now, Abraham certainly is the father of the Jewish nation. We know that. That is Abraham's natural seed. But if you're a believer here this morning, and you and I, we are part of Abraham's spiritual seed, um, spiritual descendants, if you like. Uh, he's the father of all them that believe. And here in uh, Hebrew, uh, Romans chapter 4, verse 3, it says, What does the Scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was accounted unto him for righteousness. So that means that uh, at a time when God spoke to Abraham, and one day when Abraham and Sarah had no children, um, God made a, a covenant with Abraham and, and promised him that he was going to have children. Um, and then one day God took Abraham outside of the tent and he says, Abraham, look up. And look at all the stars. He says, if you can count the number of those stars, you will be able to count your children also. In fact, God says the literal wording was, so shall your descendants be. So shall your descendants be, or this many shall your descendants be. And when God said that, Bible says that Abraham believed God. And that believing not only made it all happen in the end, but that believing was accounted unto him for righteousness. All right? Right standing. Uh, and actually, our faith is accounted unto us for right, righteousness as well because we can't make ourselves righteous. 
<laughs> we can all be made righteous by faith in God. But the interesting part here is that it says that Abraham believed God and it was accounted unto him for righteousness. It, it was accounted unto him for righteousness. What is it? It is Abraham's believing. Um, and interestingly, in verse 9, it goes on to say, it says, uh, Romans chapter 4, verse 9, it says, For we say that faith was accounted to Abraham for righteousness. So the Bible uses faith and believing interchangeably. All right? Uh, faith means believing, and believing means having faith. Um, and actually, if we were to go back into uh, Genesis chapter 15, where that incident took place, uh, we have it printed in the outline, but we're not going to go over there right now. Uh, but we read over there that it says that Abraham believed in God, and it was accounted unto him for righteousness. And then we read in the New Testament, and it says that Abraham believed God, and it was accounted unto him for righteousness. And friends, here's the point. Faith does both. Faith believes in God, and faith believes God. Again, faith believes in God, meaning faith believes in the existence of God. But faith doesn't stop there. Faith believes God, and specifically, it believes the word that God has spoken. Now, here is where it sets us apart if we declare and say that we are faith people. There are many people who say they believe in God, but they do not believe the written word of God. All right? So, therefore, therefore, there's a problem. Uh, we're really saying, is this really Bible faith? Because Bible faith not only believes in God, but Bible faith believes in God and believes what God has said. And in order for us to walk by faith, we need to believe that the Bible is the written word of God. In fact, <laughs> it's tragic, but the reality is, friends, that across the board, across the church world, around the world, um, many times the book is hardly ever opened the word is no longer hardly preached. I don't know what they preach. Uh, um, uh, but, but even if the word is preached from, there are people sitting back and say, well, you know, I believe in God, but I'm not, if I'm not sure if I believe what's written in the book. But in order for you and I to have strong faith, we must believe what's written in the book. Right. All right. Because the written word of God is ultimately what brings faith into our hearts. The Bible says faith comes by hearing. And we discussed that uh, to quite an extent last week. Faith comes by hearing the word of God. It comes by hearing the word of God taught. And it comes by hearing the word preached. Uh, meaning the teaching and the proclamation of God's word causes faith to rise in our hearts. So let me say it again. The first pillar when it comes to real Bible faith is that faith must believe. All right, so somewhere along the line, we've got to make a decision that when we approach the Word of God, we have already pre decided that we're going to believe what the book says. All right, it's not like I mean, we look at some verse and we don't then decide, oh, will I believe this or not believe this? We've already pre decided, we have decided that the Word of God. Uh, that the Bible is the written Word of God. And of course, we've got a number of uh, courses and various modules that we teach to verify that the Bible is indeed the pure, unadulterated Word of God and that we can have total and utter faith in it. Um, and we must do so in order to claim to have real Bible faith. So once again, the first pillar is that, that uh, faith must believe. Um, and, uh, you know, sometimes we refer to ourselves as Christians, and of course that's quite right. Um, but many times we refer to ourselves as believers. All right? We name ourselves uh, uh, by the very fact that we believe. We, we have chosen to believe not only in the existence of God, but we have chosen to believe in the written word of God. That when God speaks, that is the word of the Lord. Um, and so that's the first pillar um, in terms of having uh, and operating in real Bible, Bible faith. Now the second pillar is faith must speak. Faith must speak. Um, there's really no such thing 
a silent Bible faith. Faith must speak. And many times people don't know this, um, and they're not purposeful in their speaking. And many times people speak the very opposite of faith, and yet they're trying to walk by faith, but because they don't know it, it kind of muddles them up and it holds them back. Uh, because really there is like, there's like oodles of scriptures in the whole Bible that declares that the very words of our mouth will determine where we're going to go. It will determine whether we will experience life or whether we will experience death. The Bible says that death and life are in the power of the tongue. Is that what? Proverbs chapter 18 verse 21 or is it verse, chapter 21 verse 18? I get those two muddled up. I should really get this right. But anyway, death and life are in the power of the tongue. And many people experience a whole lot of death and a whole lot of disaster and a whole lot of... Um, breakdown and a whole lot of sickness because that's what they speak all the time. So for us as the people of faith, we train ourselves to learn the language of faith. We train ourselves to speak faith. Um, let me go over to Romans chapter 10. And in verse 10, um, that describes, that passage describes the mechanics of getting born again. Um, it speaks about how a person can come from darkness into light, can come from the kingdom of darkness over into the kingdom of Jesus Christ, uh, on, on how to be born again. And specifically, in verse 10, it says, For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, but it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. Let me read it again because this is very profound and very powerful and extremely important. For it is with your heart that you believe. All right, we've just discussed believing. We said that faith must believe, and that's what it does. But it says, and that you're justified, but it, it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. So what that tells us is that we're not really saved until we engage our mouth and declare what we believe by calling or declaring or professing Jesus Christ as Lord of our lives. Believing alone is not enough. Believing is only one pillar. <laughs> and uh, if I were to use that word pillar and talk about wheels... Um, I remember many years ago, uh, I was uh, with somebody that had one of those um, cycles that only had one wheel. And, um, and they were really good at it. It's like, how can you drive on this thing? So I had a bit of a go at it. Uh, and I never did quite master it, but I wasn't far off. I wasn't far off. If I had persevered, uh, I would have been able to get there to ride on the cycle. What did they call it? A monocycle? or? Unicycle. All right. So it means uni is just one. It's just one wheel. Um, and, uh, and it takes great skill. And gosh, you, if you don't watch out, you land on your face. Somehow it's just uh, like you've got to know what you're doing. Uh, and and, and uh, really, uh, uh, most of us know how to ride a bicycle. It's got two wheels. It's a bit easier. But you know what? One thing that I've discovered when I first learned on how to ride a bicycle, it's got two wheels. As soon as you stop, if you don't put your foot down, you fall over. Uh, and in fact, once or twice, and some of you might have seen this before, where you see these guys on the, on the motorway out there cycling, and they got them special um, pedals where they have a little cage around and, and so forth. And when they stop at the red lights, and if they don't get their foot up really quickly and put it on the ground, they just fall over. How many of you have ever seen somebody fall over? I've seen it. Uh, uh, why? Because two wheels are great to ride on, but you stop, and as soon as you stop, you fall over. And then, of course, we talk about a tricycle. Uh, a tricycle, uh, you can actually sit on, and you can stop, and you won't fall over. But, uh, you know, they reckon with these uh, quad bikes, uh, which have got four wheels, they reckon the tricycle sickles are actually still quite unstable when it comes to it and in parts quite dangerous. And if we were to bring that whole area over into the area of faith, and faith must have so many wheels in order for us to be stable. And when sometimes people faith falls over, it means that they haven't employed those four wheels. They haven't put in those four pillars that we're describing here today. And sadly it does happen. Somebody, suddenly somebody's faith falls over. It's like what's happened. They stopped and they fell over. All right. But real Bible faith with four pillars or with four wheels know, knows how to keep going, knows how to keep upright, and knows how to keep on functioning. And let me tell you, I'm preaching better today than what you give me credit for. Praise God. <laughs> So believing alone is not enough. 
All right. But people say, I believe. And, and then I say, okay, let's hear it. Let's hear it. What do you believe? A couple of weeks ago, we had a baptism service. And we get people to confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord on their life. And then we say, on the confession of your faith, I now baptize you, and so forth. We want to hear from them, all right? So there's no such thing as a, a silent thing. Let's just, you know, just dunking people in water. That alone doesn't get the job done. It's the confession of their faith. That's the most important thing, all right? They're now declaring with their mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, all right? So second pillar, when it comes to the operation of faith, it means that faith must speak. Uh, here in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and in verse 13, um, Paul the Apostle says, he says, For since we have the same spirit of faith, according to what is written, I believed and therefore I spoke. And then he says, we also believe and therefore speak. All right, so Paul the Apostle here is quoting the psalmist from Psalm 116 where the psalmist says, he says, he says that he believed and therefore spoke. All right? He didn't just say, I believed and I was silent. He says, I believed and therefore I spoke. He says, I spoke because I believed. And when somebody believes uh, and they understand this, they will actually speak. And then Paul says, he says, we have the same spirit of faith. He says, we also believe and therefore speak. Anyone that has real Bible faith will speak faith. Let me say it again. Anyone that has real Bible faith will speak faith. Anybody who does not, not have Bible faith will just speak fact. Have you noticed there's a difference between faith and fact? Fact is what's on the ground. Fact is what we experience. Fact is, deals with the symptoms, the situations, the problems. How do you know it's not hard to find problems and to just declare what the problem is? Uh, so there's a problem, there's a problem. And, and, then, and then if all we do is declare the problem, uh, all we declare is the disasters, all we declare is what's on the ground, we will keep on getting the same thing because, you see, death and life is in the power of our tongue. And uh, as I say, when Pastor Vanessa and I laid a hold of these truths, we gave each other permission to pull each other up. And we wasn't going to allow each other to speak death. We wasn't going to allow each other to speak doubt and unbelief. And we did it as graciously uh, as what we could with one another. And we didn't always appreciate it, but we said, nonetheless, this is important. Because if we want to go uh, where we believe God wants us to go, we need to work together with this, thing, with this thing. Both of us need to be on board and we need to move forward together. So, and then, so, and so somebody said something, oh, no, 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 that's not faith. Or, or, or is that what you want to have happen? Uh, and, and so we, we, we learn to no longer speak certain things. Uh, uh, we no longer speak or declare certain things. Um, and uh, so, for example, we, we no longer say, oh, I think I'm getting sick. We no longer say that. We, we would train ourselves to just reword things, and we would say, well, I think I'm standing against sickness here today. I think I'm standing against sickness, so it puts me in charge rather than, oh, I think I'm getting sick. It means I'm the victim here. We decided we wasn't going to be victims anymore. We decided that we was going to have the victory. All right. We would never say things like, oh, I'd like to buy this, but I can't afford that. Uh, that's defeat language. That's part of the language of death. So we say, well, I choose not to buy that right now. All right. I choose not to buy that right now. And, uh, and not today, all right? Uh, so, so in other words, I'm still in charge. Um, it means that I'm still wise about it. It means that I don't just do crazy things as sometimes people do when they claim to walk by faith and they buy things they haven't got money for and everything. Uh, people do crazy things. But no, we said we, we walk in wisdom here and we just make sure that our confession uh, is a confession of faith rather than a confession of doubt and unbelief. All right? How do you know what I'm talking about? And gosh, uh, it's, uh, you just got to pull yourself up. And uh, this is like a, a quest that uh, it takes a while to reach 
yourself of the language of doubt and unbelief, uh, and but just declaring fact. Um, and uh, but for us as the people of faith, we don't want to just declare fact. It's when we declare fact, we want to use wording that will not put us under the circumstances, that it puts us over the circumstances. All right. Somebody said, "How how are you doing?" And they say, "Oh, not too bad under the circumstances. You know, not too bad under the circumstances." Friends, we're not under the circumstances. We're above it. All right. God's put us in charge. God says, I'll make you the head and not the tail to be above only and not beneath. He says, I've blessed you with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. But you see, it requires faith to declare that. And that's the difference between, uh, between fact talk and faith talk. When we learn how to declare faith, not everybody appreciates it. M many people don't understand it. Uh, but we no longer subscribe uh, to uh, a lot of the things that the devil wants to bring into our lives. You know, it's been said that it's a little bit like, you know, the devil gives somebody a symptom uh, and somehow, you know, something tries to come on them and, uh, and then they say, oh, I think I'm getting sick. And guess what? That's absolutely what's happening because they've signed with the words of their own mouth. They've now declared and they've now accepted what the devil is bringing their way. It's a little bit like when a courier comes to your house and now there's many of these parcels that they send out, they want a signature. You know what? If, they, if you don't sign it, they will take it away again. Um, and, and, and so it is. So if the devil wants to bring something to us and we don't sign for it with the words of our mouth, he will take it away again. Uh, in fact, if anything, we tell him, we say, I resist you, devil, take it away again. I'm not having this here. I'm not signing for sickness and disease. I'm not signing for poverty. I'm not signing for strife and for division. I'm not signing for a lot of that nonsense that the devil wants to bring into our lives. All right. So Paul says, uh, he says, we also, he says, having the same spirit of faith as it is written. As it is written. So again, he refers to the written word of God. Paul wasn't making stuff up. All right? He referred to the written word of God. And when we want to have a spirit of faith, we make the written word of God a priority in our lives. He says, he says I believed um, and therefore I spoke. This is what the psalmist says. And Paul says, we also believe and therefore speak. And you see, anyone who has real Bible faith will speak faith. Um, and the best way to speak faith is to say exactly what God says about us. That's the best way to describe, like, what's, what, what shall I say about myself? Well, say what God says about you. All right. So I don't call myself a poor or rotten sinner anymore. I declare that I'm the righteousness of God in Christ because that's what God says. All right, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. God says, I'm the righteousness of God in Christ, so that's what I declare. All right, so I no longer say I'm hoping to go to heaven, but I, I, I declare that I'm saved um, and that I'm on my way to heaven, that absolutely uh, there's no further any, any dialogue or any discussion or any, uh, what's the word, negotiation around that. Once we are saved, we are saved. Bible says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Let him say so. Let him not waver. Let him not say one, one day, oh, I think I'm saved. The next day, oh, I'm not sure if I'm saved. No, I'm saved. All right. Uh, and then, and then uh, we say what God says, and God says that we have been healed by the stripes of Jesus. Now, I know what's happening on the ground, that sometimes we're dealing with fact that there are symptoms there, but our confession is not the symptom and the fact that we're dealing with on the ground. Our confession is is the faith. Uh, our confession is what God says about us. So we say, I'm healed by the stripes of Jesus. Um, and, uh, and people say, oh man, I'm so hard up. Everything is so hard. Everything is so difficult and I can't pay my bills and everything. We no longer say that. We say, I'm blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And really some of that necessitates us knowing the word. If people don't know the word, they don't know how to confess. This is one of the reasons why we write the word down and we put it into outlines. And this is why we stream it out to the whole wide world and we help people. We got stuff on our website and everything and we got it on our app and everything to get the word out so at a moment's notice if you choose to uh, let me say it again uh, rephrase that if you if you have somehow lost the outline you can always find it again and pull it back up again and all week long feed your own faith rather than just feeding on the facts and just confessing the facts all right so we say what God says faith speaks the desired end result 
Faith speaks the desired end result. It may be a fact that I'm standing against sickness and disease. It may be a fact, but I speak the desired end result, and that is this, that I'm healed by the stripes of Jesus. All right. Truth be known, before I got up here, I wasn't feeling all that great. In fact, I had to go outside and just rebuke the devil a little bit. So somehow, I don't know what, what, what went on, but sometimes, you know, the devil tries to come in sideways and distract us and everything. And so I'm not saying, oh, I think I'm getting sick. Oh, can anybody else preach today? It says, no, devil, you take that rubbish away. I'm not receiving it. I, I resist you in the mighty name of Jesus. I declare a victory yeah. over Sickness and disease over the devil, and, and I declare that no weapon formed against me shall prosper. And once we learn the word, once we know how to arm ourselves with the scriptures, it becomes a whole new ball game. It becomes an enjoyable ball game. Then life becomes enjoyable when suddenly you're indeed the head and not the tail. When suddenly you're above only and not beneath. You know, people talk about the ups and downs. We should say we should we only have ups and ups rather than ups and downs. <laughs> okay. Turn to the person next to you and say up and up. <laughs> up and up. <laughs> Faith always says what God says. So we learn to search the scriptures. What does God say about me? You know, a quick summary of what's helped me when we first learned this. Three points, uh, and if you can memorize those, then you put your streaks ahead. Number one, you say, I am who God says I am. Number two, I have what God says I have. And number three, I can do what God says I can do. All right. Number, number one, I am who God says I am. Number two, I have what God says I have. And number three, I can do what God says I can do. If you can memorize that and just somehow just declare that uh, and, and, as I say, bring some scriptures in to reinforce because that's basically a summary uh, of things uh, in terms of who we are, what we have, and what we can do. Now, of course, you know, we're on the ground, friends. How many of you know that we haven't gone to heaven yet? We're on the ground. Sometimes things get a bit challenging. And somewhere, somehow, stuff is, we face that we've got to address. And we've got to say, look, there is an issue here. There is a, a challenge going on. Uh, and because we prefer to use the word challenge more than a problem, because problem is already like, you know, challenge is probably a better one. Uh, that we've got a stepping stone here rather than something for us to stumble over and, and, and fall and everything. So we just learn how to talk about things still from a faith angle rather than purely from a fact angle. And that takes some skill. That takes some, like, oh. And sometimes it's best not to say anything rather than say the wrong thing. <laughs> and many people find that when they first get a hold of the word of faith that we're describing here today, and when they want to learn uh, and, and how to operate in the spirit of faith that we're describing here today, all of a sudden they haven't got much to say anymore. <laughs> and that's a good thing. It's best to be quiet than to say the wrong thing. Even if people don't know how to say the right thing, sometimes it's best to just keep quiet and not say anything. <laughs> all right? If you don't say nothing, you can't be incriminated. All right, they say that. You know, you've got the right to remain silent. Praise God. Anyway, I've heard that in the movies. <laughs> Never experienced that myself and not planning to. <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> you've got the right to remain silent. And the devil says, come on, say something, say something. And we say, no, devil, I'm now not saying anything. I'm now just going to, you know, the Bible says, be quick to hear and slow to speak. Quick to hear, slow to speak. Two ears, one mouth. <laughs> Everybody all right this morning? I don't know how this turned into a children's church lesson, but you know what? You know, but you, sometimes you've got to bring it way down and say, okay, this is where we live, friends. This is where we live. And, and, and because we could tell, I've got to say something here. And, well, you know, I'm, I'm just going to say something now. No, no. If, if you don't know uh, what faith says in that situation, best not to say anything. <laughs> okay. And then pray and say, search the scriptures, Lord. How can I talk about this without, uh, you know, getting into, into doubt and unbelief? So again, faith always says what God says. And uh, 
because the other point there, it's right in your outline. Faith always speaks the desired end result. So I declare that all of my needs are met according to God's riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Because after all, that's what Philippians chapter 4 verse 19 tells me. That's what God says about me. Then, uh, then God says, uh, God says that, that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Sometimes we look at someone and say, oh, I, I can't do this. I uh, say, so, well, we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. Suddenly it shifts, it shifts us into a whole new place. And indeed, certain things we couldn't do, and suddenly when we change our confession, suddenly we can do it. All right? And, and, and people say, I can't do this anymore. You know, the, well, it's amazing what we can do if we set our mind to it and if we choose to do things by faith. Sometimes, uh, you know, I said this before, but faith is not just made for the tough days. Faith is also made for the good days. And we learn how to walk by faith in the good days. And having done all to stand, uh, Ephesians chapter 6, having done all to stand, stand therefore. Sometimes we've got to just fortify ourselves and say, well, you know what? Uh, uh, moving forward is just a bit hard right now, but at least I'm going to stand. And because I've got all four, four wheels, I've got all four pillars, I'm not falling over like them people on that monocycle, on that unicycle, on that bicycle when they stop. I'm just, I'm just standing right now and praise God I'm just figuring out, I'm just trusting God that God will show me the next step going forward. I'm just fighting the good fight of faith and uh, fighting the good fight of faith is sometimes just fighting the words that want to come up from the inside of us uh, or from our flesh to say the wrong thing. That's part of fighting the good fight of faith. Romans chapter 4 verse 16 Therefore, it is of faith. Again, still talking about faith. It says, therefore, it is of faith that it might be according to grace so that the promise might be sure to all the seed, not only to those who are of the law, but also those who are of faith, uh, of faith, or of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, verse 17, I have made you a father of many nations. See, God spoke that. And it's written in the word. God spoke to Abraham and he says, Abraham, in fact, he said, Abram, which used to be his name, he says, Abram, we're going to change your name today. All right? You're no longer just, a, just a, an exalted person. I'm, I'll make you the father of many nations. And we're going to change your name from Abram to Abraham, which means father of many nations. He goes on to say, in the presence of him whom he believed. God, who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did. Like, wow, it's just all in here. You know, the Bible tells us that God also operates by faith. And God calls those things that do not exist as though they did. And when we want to walk by faith and we want to say the right thing, we need to get our head around this and our heart around it and say, how can I speak uh, uh, about things that do not exist as though they did? So we speak about the fact that we're healed even though we may be experiencing sickness right now. We speak about the fact that we are prosperous according to God's word, though we may be struggling to pay our bills right now, but we have to learn to walk by faith. The God who gives life to the dead and calls those things that do not exist as though they did. King James Version says that the God who gives life to the dead and calls those things to be not as though they were. Calls those things to be not as though they were. What is that? It's walking by faith. It's learning to speak about things before we see them with our physical eyes. It's learning to speak about things that we see in the Word before we fully experience them uh, in, our, in our circumstances and in our situations. You see, Abraham... Um, God promised him that he was going to have descendants. And uh, because things weren't happening, um, he got into the flesh. Um, in fact, Sarah said, look, it says, it's not happening. Uh, why don't you go and take one of our servant girls there and have a child with her, so at least we can have an offspring. And that was not entirely uncommon uh, in those days. Um, surrogacy, I suppose you might call it. And uh, Hagar, the servant girl, brought forth a boy, and they called him Ishmael. <laughs> you know, I don't mean to dwell on this too much, but you know, if these two hadn't gotten into the flesh over it, we wouldn't have the problem in the Middle East that we're having today. Just a thought. Just a thought. So, so they bring forth that boy called Ishmael, 
And then uh, when God says to, to Abraham, he says, Abraham, we're going to change your name. I'll, I'll make you the father of many nations. And uh, Abraham says, I'll long live Ishmael before you. And God says, no, 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 no. He says, yes, he says, I've heard you. I'll bless the boy. And he's going to have 12 sons and they're going to be 12 princes and so forth and so forth. But he says, he says, he says, in, 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 in your son, he says, uh, your son is going to be the son of promise. So when he says, I'll make you the father of many nations, he says, you're going to have a child that you haven't even, even produced yet. And so the deal's this. That God called Abraham the father of many nations before he even had conceived Isaac. God already spoke the desired end result before Abraham and, and, uh, and Sarah had even come together. And, uh, and that's something that we have to learn to do. We have to look at the word and say what the word says as though it's, it's true, which it is, and as though it had already happened, and it wants to happen, but we've got to declare it. Remember salvation when we started out way back on this one point, and I know I'm laboring this point a little bit. People are not saved until they confess their faith. People believe, but it's not until confession is made unto salvation that salvation truly is activated uh, and is ours. And so it is with many things in God's word. Many of the promises, we've got to own them by start, starting to confess them, to declare them. And so sometimes I'm very purposeful about uh, declaring certain things uh, because I want to speak faith. And I want to declare things. I declare things that God has promised me. And there's like promises galore. And, and sometimes I do just random. I just whatever comes up first, I just randomly confess the word. Uh, and uh, scriptures that I've put into my heart over the years, I just pull them out and declare them because it's part of my, of my faith declaration to just declare things and over and over. And as I say, I'm never plain. I never plan to sit on a unicycle where my faith is concerned and stop and fall over. Never plan to do that. <laughs> I never plan to sit on a bicycle and stop and fall over. My faith, I will never allow it to fall over because I want to make sure that all four pillars are fully functioning and standing and all four wheels are turning, so to speak, so that no matter what situation that I'm in, uh, even if forward progress is sometimes a bit slow, and even if somehow in, in the day of battle I need to stop, then at least I'm doing what Ephesians chapter 6 says, having done all to stand, stand therefore. Stand your ground. Don't let the devil push you back. Don't let him sidetrack you. Don't let him push you into the ditch on one side of the road or on the other side of the road. Having done all to stain, stain there for. And then we wait on God and, and trust God that he will show us the way forward so we can have some forward movement again. So again, uh, God calls those things that do not yet exist as though they did. God called Abram, Abraham the father of many nations, before Isaac was even conceived. That's what God said. And guess what? From that moment forward, when Abraham was introducing himself to somebody, he would say, like what we would do today, how they did things back then, I don't know whether they, you know. But we would say, hey, my name's Abraham. <laughs> and because Abraham to us is just a name, but to them, he says, hey, I'm the father of many nations. Like, where are they all? You call yourself healed? Show, show us. He said, no, don't, don't enter into discussions with people that don't understand. You call yourself healed because that's what God calls you. All right. God says that we were healed by the stripes of Jesus. And uh, call yourself prosperous, uh, but sometimes it's not good, to, it's not good to, to, you know, speak certain things in front of people that do not understand. It just makes for silly questions. It makes for silly arguments that are not necessary. Uh, just sometimes you've got to just be wise as to what you put before people. Uh, to use a strong word that Jesus used one day, he says, no, he says, don't throw pearls before swines. Uh, how many of you know that that's a strong word, isn't it? <laughs> and, uh, and sometimes I'm not calling anybody a, 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 um, anything today. <laughs> but you just be wise about it, all right? Everybody okay this morning? Praise God. Is anybody learning anything this morning? Yeah. Praise God. All right, here we go. 
speak to decide end result. Uh, point number three, this is the third pillar or the third wheel, if you like, faith must act. So the first pillar was faith must believe. The second one was faith must speak. And the third one is faith must act. Real Bible faith will produce a corresponding action to what we are declaring, what we are believing. All right. And here in James chapter 2, verse 26, James speaking. And James uh, was the pastor at the church in Jerusalem. And James uh, tells us here, he says, For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. So we've just said before that believing alone is not enough. We've got to speak. And now we're hearing that even believing and speaking alone is not enough. We've got to act. Because faith without works is dead. Somebody can have their whole believing all sorted out, can have their confession, the confession of faith all sorted out. But if they're not acting, it's still dead faith. All right? Remember, there's four pillars that are required, not two. There's four wheels uh, on this faith wagon, not just one or two or three. Uh, faith without works is dead. One translation says useless. All right? And then it uses the example how um, Abraham, um, after Isaac was born, one day God says to him, take the boy, bring him up to one of the mountains that I will show you and sacrifice him there um, before me. Now, of course, um, um, God had no intentions on having the boy slain before him. God wasn't into human sacrifice one little bit, with the exception of Jesus Christ. And this is, we haven't got time to get into all the detail there. Uh, but when Abraham heard the word of the Lord, he says, all right, God, I'll do it. So he grabbed the boy, he grabbed some firewood, grabbed some fire, and headed up the hill. And, and then James goes on to say, he says, so you see, that Abraham was not only saved by faith, but he was also saved by works because he added a corresponding action into this whole deal. And when we read the word, when we see the word, and we start believing it, and we start confessing it, we need to add action into this whole thing. James furthermore uses Rahab, um, the, uh, the prostitute in the Old Testament, as an example. She says, you see how she hid the spies when they came, and as it were sided with the right people, says how her faith saved her. And he spoke about that action that she produced along with hearing the word of the Lord. They told her who they were. And in, she believed the word of the Lord. And rather than having them exposed and having them dealt to, she realized that these people were sent by God, as it were. So she sided with them, hid them, and then sent them away uh, another way, and so forth. And it was her action that saved her. So that's the third uh, wheel or the third pillar that faith must act. You see, when the word tells us that we are to praise and worship God, then praise and worship God we will. We no longer negotiate. When the Bible says rejoice always and again I say rejoice, we rejoice always and again we say we rejoice. We no longer start negotiating. Uh, it's, it's like, and I know the devil wants us to question, the uh, devil wants us to question it and the flesh wants us to negotiate and say, yeah, I know what the word says, but I, uh, I'd rather be miserable right now. No, the word says rejoice. And again I say rejoice. We add faith action to everything that we read and everything that we believe. All right? When God says that we do honor him uh, with our substance and with the first fruits of all of our possessions, then we, that's what we do because that's what the, our faith action, if we really want to enter into the super abundance that God has for us, we've got to do what the Word says regarding finances. We no longer negotiate. It's all with the devil. Let's, let's have a negotiation around this. We say, no, uh, devil, we no longer negotiate with you uh, and we no longer negotiate uh, regarding the Word of God. If that's what the Word says, we believe it, number one. Number two, we speak it. And number three, we act on it. Add a corresponding action into the steel. Um, faith without works is dead. Uh, works here speaks about a corresponding action. So if we, we believe that we healed by the stripes of Jesus, where possible, we act healed. All right? 
<laughs> and I'm not mean to minimize that sometimes people just are going through all sorts of terrible things as far as, you know, sickness and disease is concerned. But sometimes, you know, the flesh, sometimes the flesh likes a bit of sympathy. Oh, if people only knew how difficult it is for me right now. Listen, there's no point in trying to draw sympathy from anybody. Let's do what we can in order to just, if we're able to walk, then let's walk. Uh, and uh, I remember the, the testimony that uh, Kenneth Hagen told when he was a young 16-year-old lying on the bed of sickness, uh, and he was getting ready, like, you know, they, they were getting ready for him to, to, to die. Uh, he had three incurable diseases. Uh, he was completely paralyzed by then, and when he started to read uh, the book uh, and started to read the Bible and realized that God had called him healed, and then he realized that in order for him to walk by faith, he needs to call himself healed. So he started to confess that he was healed by the stripes of Jesus, though he was partially even paralyzed in his mouth, but he mumbled as best as he could, and he declared his healing. And then he says he made every effort to swing himself off the bed and, and so forth. And a few times he went crashing down, but he kept on persisting because he realized that not only must he believe, not only must he speak, but he must also act. So let's act what we know to act in order. The Bible says that that's how our faith is made complete because dead faith is, is useless. But a faith that's alive and that's complete will work for us. James 1.22 don't just listen to God's word. We must do what it says. Otherwise, you're only fooling yourselves. So it is possible, it is possible to become self-deluded self by just hearing the word, thinking, oh, this is wonderful, and choosing to believe it as it were, even confessing it, but without adding action to this whole thing. It's still not the real deal. Uh, remember that... Uh, Real Bible faith requires four pillars, and this is the third pillar that I would like to submit to you today. Faith must act. Uh, the Bible says here in James, in one translation, that we are doers of the word and not hearers only. And you know what grieves me is when you see Christians that are not doing what the Word says, and yet they know what the Word says in some areas, but they're not doing what the Word says, and so therefore their faith in that area of their life isn't working. Because dead faith is useless. It doesn't work. So let's do what we know to do. Act on the Word where we know to act on the Word. And then the fourth pillar Faith must be energized by love. Faith must be energized by love. Let me read to you from Galatians chapter 4, verse 5 and 6. For we through the Spirit eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. So he's still speaking about faith. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but faith working through love. So Paul the Apostle there, speaking to the Galatian people who somehow thought that if they were to go back under the law of Moses and start to go through all the rituals, circumcision, special days, special foods and everything in order to gain favor with God, he says, hey guys, this is not where it's at. Once you're saved, he says, the law is dealt with and you, you're now under grace. Um, and he says, so in Christ, circumcision doesn't avail anything. And other people say, well, let's not do anything. It's like uncircumcision. Well, actually, that, that doesn't avail anything either. It's only faith that avails anything before God. And, of course, faith does more than just sit there and say, I believe it. Faith speaks, faith acts. And now the Bible tells us that faith energizes our love. When we begin to walk by faith, we, when, when, yeah, when we start walking by faith, we make love a high priority in our life. Because the faith walk and the love walk are really the same. It's just different words that uh, describes what to focus on at any given time. If I try to walk by faith and I'm not walking in love, then the love is missing to energize my faith. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 13, Paul speaks about 
It's a gift to the Spirit. It talks about tongues. It talks about this. It talks about love all the way down. And down in verse 13 it says, And now abide, and now remain, faith, hope, and love. Faith alone doesn't get the job done. You see, hope, when we read the word, it puts a hope before us. And with our hope, we can see what God has made available to us. With our faith, we lay a hold of it. And provided we walk by love, our faith will be energized and will keep on working and will, uh, in the end, get the job done. Faith is energized by love. That's what it tells us here. In the Amplified Translation, again, in verse 6, it says, Faith is activated, energized, and expressed, and working through love. Faith is working through love. Faith is energized through love. So what does that mean? Well, when people get all out of sorts, and they get out of love, they get offended, they get into strife, into gossip, they're not faith people. <laughs> they're not faith people. Because faith people learn how to remain in love and to keep themselves uh, in the love walk because the love walk is so necessary in order for their faith to keep on working. It's been said that, uh, in fact, we heard this years ago, um, that, you know, you get around some of, some of our fathers in the faith, whether that's Kenneth Hagin, Kenneth Copeland, because Kenneth Hagin's gone to heaven a number of years ago. Kenneth Copeland's still alive, and some of these faith, what we might call the faith greats, who have taught faith, and, uh, and those who are still around today. So you, it's been said that you get around them, and you start to run somebody down in front of them, you won't get very far. They will stop you right there. Or start to sort of tell, tell on people, get into gossip. It just, it just won't get very far. They're just not, they will not engage um, they will not engage in, the, in, in that talk because, after all, uh, to use a colloquial expression, it is got to talk. Start talking about other people and the whole gossip side of things and the whole uh, accusations and stuff that goes on. And then, you know, strife is always looking for company. Somebody gets into strife, and what do they do? They tell other people about this terrible thing that has happened over here and on and on and on and on. And on. Faith people don't do that. Because faith people know that I need my love to be strong and to be operating. If I want to have strong faith, I've got to have strong love. And I cannot get out, out of the love walk. Because as soon as I'm out of the love walk, I'm out of my faith walk as well. Is that helping anybody here today? It's like keep your heart pure, my friend. Uh, let's, let's, let's do what we can in order to keep love functioning in our hearts. And let's choose to walk in forgiveness always. Forgive, quick, 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 quick to forgive. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. There's like scriptures in all directions. If we start in the middle of the Bible, both to the left and both to the right. Both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, it's love, love, love is the predominant thing. Um, in fact, it's interesting that uh, Kenneth Hagin used to sometimes make reference to the fact that sometimes they called him the, the, uh, you know, the preacher of faith. He says, but I reckon I'm more of a preacher of love than I'm a preacher on faith. Because he had the revelation. And it seems, by the sounds of it, and like I've, so Pastor Vanessa and I have heard his stories like multiple times, same stories told over and over, just to describe to us uh, what faith looks like. And then uh, seemingly he seems to have come from quite a broken family situation and just break down and just dysfunction like, like you know, um, we would have a hard time to imagine. Yet he said he, said he decided to love everybody. He wasn't going to get on the bandwagon with this side of the family or that side of the family or that side of the family. Think, things were splitted and splintered and what have you. He said, no, I'm going to walk by faith here. And he just tell people, look, I love you. Uh, and, and just decide that he was going to walk in love. Uh, and somewhere we've got to make a decision. We're just going to, we're just going to let things go. Bad stuff's gone down in most people's lives. Uh, and if it hasn't yet, my friend, get ready. Somewhere something's going to happen that will give you and I the opportunity to tick us off and to get offended and to get out of love because the devil will make sure of it. And people being people, sometimes uh, it's just what happens. Uh, so let's just make a decision right now. We're going to just walk in love regardless. We're going to keep our hearts free from offenses. Guard your heart with all diligence for out of it flows the issues of life. Guard your heart. Guard your heart. Not just guard your head, guard your heart. Because with the heart man believes unto righteousness 
and but the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Faith is not of the head. Faith is of the heart. So guard your heart. Where do offenses happen? They don't happen in the head. They happen in the heart. <laughs> All right. Praise God. What are the four pillars of real Bible faith? Well, number one, faith must believe. Number two, faith must speak. And number three, faith must act. And number four, faith must be energized by love. And friends, we take these things on board, it'll take our faith, to a, faith walk to an entirely new level. Let me just close with a word of prayer and uh, just allow God to uh, perhaps minister to people's hearts here this morning and uh, just whatever um, is going on in your life right now, um, you know it, or at least you know part of it, but God knows it all. And what's happening in your circumstances, and things are difficult. I appreciate that sometimes things get very difficult. But though by faith, the Bible says that many are the afflictions of the righteous, but out of them all the Lord delivers us. God has a deliverance for you, my friend. God has a breakthrough for you in your particular situation. Praise God. Father, we commit this word to you that we've heard this morning, the word that we will take into our small group environment and, Lord, uh, have a discussion in regards to how we can best encourage each other to implement this word, to keep on doing the word regardless, no matter what. And I pray, God, that there be a revelation of everything that we've discussed here today in each and every one of our hearts. That, Lord, we were not here this morning to receive information. We need revelation. Thank you, Father. The truth is revealed to us. That the eyes of everyone's understanding is enlightened and open. We can see things we have never seen before. You pointed things out, Lord, not only through the preaching of the word, but by the power of your spirit. And Frank, just as I'm praying, God's been speaking to you all morning. And not just through the teaching of the word, but God specifically, by the power of his spirit, makes this word applicable to your life, to your situation, to your circumstances. Where you're at, uh, God made that very applicable uh, in your life right now. So if there's any area where perhaps... Uh, you know that you need to make some adjustments, uh, that you know that in an area, perhaps uh, an area where he've, you've not been a doer of the word and suddenly you realize, I must become a doer and I, I'm making a decision to do so right now. Or perhaps in an area where you've been trying to walk by faith, but you've been speaking the wrong thing uh, ongoing. You've been speaking death instead of life. Whatever that looks like to you right now, uh, just make a decision that you're going to be one of those faith people, that you're going to absolutely walk into, or step into high faith. Praise God. And that perhaps in an area where you might have held and harbored unforgiveness towards somebody, and you chose to be ticked off, ongoing, rather than forgive and to let things go. Maybe that's an area for you to address this morning, and God will help you. Uh, God helps us all right now to let these things get settled in each and every one of our hearts. I wonder if there's anybody here this morning that would say, oh, I believe that God spoke to me, and you would indicate so with your uplifted hand. I believe that God's speaking uh, to people right now. There's areas uh, that, need to be, that need to be adjusted, and sometimes it's just a little tweak. Sometimes it's just a little tweak. I see those hands. God bless you. Thank you for responding. Thank you for responding. It's just allowing the Spirit of God to move on our hearts right now. Hallelujah, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Father, I thank you for every person in this place here today. Lord, that we are all resolved and we declare that we are the people of faith. We're not just fact people, we are faith people. That we choose to believe and we choose to speak what we believe and we choose to act on our faith and we choose to walk in love. The best faith action that you and I can have, my friend, is to walk in love towards people. That will really be all around the best faith action. Praise God. Hallelujah, Jesus. Wonderful Jesus. Wonderful Lord. Lord, we believe in you, in your existence, but we also believe the word that you have spoken. Thank you, Lord. That our faith rises to new levels. 
that you've called us to run and not be weary, to walk and we do not faint. They that wait upon the Lord, they shall renew their strength, the word says. I'm sensing that strength is renewed right now. Some of you have found things difficult in the last while. Your strength is renewed right now as we are sitting, standing in the presence of God. Faith is renewed right now. Love is renewed right now. Hope is restored right now. Some of you have had a faith project and it's taken a long time and it, you haven't yet seen what you've believed. And God wants you to know that don't let it go. Just hold on. Just hold on. Be persistent. Be persistent. Hallelujah, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. Hallelujah.